we will be announcing the winners of the silent auction. The lots you can see out here, you can still see them all. And at the end of the presentation, there will be a short amount of time for some frantic final bidding, I hope. So there will still be chances. There are still wonderful things there, obviously. They're, they're there until the, 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 the final, final bid. But there's some binoculars there. Um, there's wonderful artwork. Um, I love the little um, rain chain that Ace Hardware has given us, uh, the Hummingbird one as well, which fits perfectly with the, the theme of our keynote talk. So all sorts of wonderful things, food, places to stay, all sorts there. So do, if you haven't had a look, do take a look. And if you have, look again, because there might be something you missed. So very generous gifts, and I must thank everyone, too many to mention everyone individually, but all those people who have donated these wonderful gifts to help this little fundraising venture. And I mustn't forget, of course, to thank Karen LeMay for her organizing of this. Thank you, Karen. It was Karen who said to us, wouldn't it be a lovely idea to hold a silent auction? And my wife Mary said, yeah, it would be, Karen, but I have no idea who's going to run it. <laughs> we soon found someone. Thank you, Karen, very much. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Sherry Williamson, fresh from the Sedona Hummingbird Festival. I don't know how you keep doing it all, Sherry. I really don't. Many of you will know her from the Hummingbird banding sessions, which she does locally, which if you, again, if you haven't had a chance to go to them, they are well worth um, attending, and from her work with the Southeastern um, Arizona Bird Observatory. But rather, and expand at length on the, the many wonderful achievements that Sherry has. I'm going to leave it to her to tell you about everything that she's doing now to help what I think we must agree are some of the most wonderful creatures on this planet, hummingbirds. Over to you, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Everybody, everybody like my outfit? I've got clothes I haven't worn in almost three years. So, <laughs> let's not talk y'all. I'm in an alternate plumage for, normally, for about, oh, maybe two or three hours a year. <laughs> but I haven't been in the last few years. You know, I've done a lot of Zoom presentations during the pandemic, but you can do those. You don't have to wear pants for those. So, uh, yeah, basically, I don't have to wear anything that, you know, I can wear like, you know, some uh, old, old rock band t-shirt or something, and they're only seeing me from here up, so I look very professional. So. But I'm very glad to be here this evening, and I do have a lot to cram into this presentation, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it up really quick. Can we do some light? Y'all don't want to look at me. We can drop the lights on me too, Carlo. Uh, there we go. That that should help. Yeah, that should help a lot. Okay. All right. Woohoo! All right, we're good. Uh, so, uh, I the, the the description has promised that I'm that I'm going to tell you all kinds of good things about all kinds of good things, uh, and so I have to talk really fast. But let's start with the field guide because that is the first question almost everybody asks me: Is is your revision of the Peterson Field Guide to Hummingbirds finished yet? And it's a long story. Um, I, you know, I signed the contract to do it quite a few years ago, uh, and have been working on it, but, uh, you know, things like pandemics and, and, uh, acquisitions of bird sanctuaries have, uh, kind of gotten in the way a little bit. Uh, but, uh, but the good news is that even though the sun is setting on the Peterson Field Guide series, I was, uh, quite shocked a little over a year ago to be informed that the Peterson series was not going to be publishing any new volumes or any updates of old volumes. So, yeah, it's really, really sad. I mean, you know, an awful lot of us grew up on Peterson Field Guides. And uh, so it is very, very sad. However, on the plus side, uh, they didn't just say, so that's it, you know, good luck. Uh, instead, they sold my contract to Princeton. And Princeton does really good stuff. There are some really nice guides in the Princeton series. And it's also uh, given me a little bit more freedom to redesign the guide 
and make it make it the guide that I really wanted it to be, but that wouldn't necessarily fit into the constraints of the Peterson format. So I'm really, really excited. The If you have the, my original guide, you know that the birds were all just in little boxes. I had no control over how the plates were done. I just gave them a bunch of 35 millimeter slides, seriously, like pounds of slides. And they're graphics department did something with them, scanned them, and put them into the little boxes. I had just next to no control over that. We're freeing the birds from the little boxes. <laughs> uh, and, we're, and we're also going to give them, we're giving them a nice neutral background so that all those little white tail tips and things show up, since those are very important field marks on hummingbirds at times. Uh, we're giving them a nice neutral background, which is very much harking back to the old original Peterson guides. Uh, that often were, uh, the paintings were done on colored paper, on actually colored backgrounds. Um, and of course, now, of course, it's all electronic, uh, but it'll look very much like the, like uh, some of the existing guides in the Princeton series. There's going to be little colored bars across the tops of the pages, so you can easily get to the, to the, the section of the plates that you need to get to, but we're going to do a hybrid guide that is going to have the species accounts in the back, like the Peterson Guide has. So you'll have a lot of additional information uh, on, on the page facing the plate of the, for each species and, and you know, each, uh, uh, including the range map. But you'll be able to see a larger range map. For some species, you'll be able to see a migration, spring migration map, and have a lot of other information in the back of the guide. The other nice thing is it's going to be available in electronic format, which is very cool. Uh, the Peterson series, Houghton Mifflin never really quite got that whole new age electronic book thing uh, under their belts. So I'm very pleased about that. Uh, and also, um, thankfully, um, I've been, I haven't been uh, resting on my laurels for the last 20 years. Uh, the original guide was published in 2002. I haven't been resting on my laurels. I've been learning more about hummingbirds over the last 20 years. And a lot of what I have learned that is new is going to be incorporated or new, or at least I have a better appreciation of than I did in 2001, 2002, uh, is going to be incorporated into the guide, including new plates, uh, even new field marks. Uh, this is uh, the Anna's hummingbird has uniquely short and angular greater secondary coverts. And literally generations of ornithologists never noticed that until I happened to just have a light bulb go over my head one day sitting in my yard watching swarms of annas swirling around our feeders. Uh, and now all these things take time and with, uh, with the supply chain and all the rest of that kind of stuff, don't expect the guide to be available until next year, but uh, do, keep, do follow me on social media and, uh, and uh, keep in touch in other ways and you'll definitely see an announcement because I'm going to be Crowing it to the heavens when that book is finally out of my hands and into the publishers, and uh, and of course even more so when it uh, is finally available in print, in print and electronic form. So that's my first topic, the field guide. Got that out of the way. So let's turn to a little uh, a little different topic here. Let's talk about Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. Uh, most of you know that our, our dear friend and birding icon, Mary Jo Balator, passed away in May of 2019. Uh, it was really tough on, on uh, her friends and, and supporters, folks who had, had enjoyed her place. Of course, we all, all mourned desperately, but then the next question was, what happens to the clientele of birds, to her beautiful garden and home? What happens now, now that Mary Jo's gone? And um, unfortunately, she did not make any provisions in her will, her non-existent will, to uh, tell her heirs, her son and daughter, what she wanted done with her property and her house. But they knew how much she loved that place and how important it was to her, what a huge part of her life it's been over the last 20 years. And so um, there a, a multifaceted effort to try to save the place was undertaken. And thankfully, we had um, had the help of Tony Batiste, who was Mary Jo's dearest friend in the world, I think. And Tony was just determined not to let her place just be sold off to a random person and 
no longer be open to the public and have all the feeders pulled down and have the birds all bereft because of being denied their the beautiful buffet Mary Jo always uh, sent out to them. Uh, but Tony was able to, through some family connections, uh, find a very, very generous uh, couple of philanthropists in, in California, uh, 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 Mario Molina and his wife, Therese Flynn Molina, and they wrote a check that allowed us to buy the property. And it now belongs to the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory and is being uh, not only managed in, in under much the same philosophy as Mary Jo, but with uh, many enhancements. Unfortunately, Mary Jo uh, did have uh, a lot of health challenges in her latter years, and a lot of the very hard work of the gardening and the grounds had kind of gotten away from her. And so, uh, and plus, between the time she passed in late May and the time we acquired the property in early November, uh, an awful lot uh, had, had happened, especially since it was a very dry summer. Nobody was watering the plants. A lot of the plants died. Uh, weeds were taking over. It was really quite heartbreaking. But fortunately, with a wonderful team effort, including our dedicated uh, sanctuary volunteers, volunteers from, from the uh, Sierra Vista Area Gardeners Club, uh, we have been able to bring the place back. We've uh, replanted plants. We've removed a lot of non-native uh, species and uh, replaced them with nice, healthy new specimens of some of Mary Jo's favorite plants, both native and non-native. Of course, our collection of salvias is, uh, is quite a prize, and we're continuing to cultivate her salvia garden. Uh, we, but we have a virtual army of volunteers doing the work that was basically one woman's work, one woman's dream. Uh, and it is humbling uh, and gratifying for us to be able to carry on Mary Jo's vision and to add improvements that she always wanted to have, like rainwater. We now have uh, what is it, um, 6,000 gallons of rainwater harvesting capacity. Mary Jo always wanted to have rainwater harvesting, uh, thanks to a very generous donor who specifically wanted to help the, the garden and our pollinator uh, uh, habitat program, we were able to not only add, um, not only add uh, 6,000 gallons of rainwater harvesting capacity, but also uh, upgrade the drip irrigation system so it now runs on a system that Tom and I can can uh, reprogram and uh, turn on and off manually from our phones wherever we are. We could be sitting in a in a lodge in Mindo, Ecuador, and go, I think I'll turn on the irrigation at the sanctuary. We could do that because because it's the 21st century and you can do things like that. And we've also, we've, we have uh, renovated her gardens, the Lucifer hummingbird bed. Those of you who have visited the sanctuary know about our little teardrop shaped uh, Lucifer garden that uh, the anchor plants there, uh, anchor plant there was a, a chuparosa, which is actually a Sonoran desert species. Sonoran and Mojave Desert species that uh, I'm surprised it survives at, in that elevation and habitat, but it does. And we have since then added penstemons and cacti and a number of other beautiful plants after tearing out the weeds and digging down and, and you know, trying to line it with rocks to keep the gophers out because uh, the gophers are a continuing problem. Uh, we also resurfaced the paths to make the paths safer and more comfortable for our visitors to walk and are just trying to continue to, to, to grow Mary Jo's vision on, you know, beyond what she was able to accomplish during her lifetime. Uh, we have a number of new amenities as well. The old photo blind that uh, was off to the south side of the property has been replaced by a new photo blind on the north side. There was a photo blind on the north side of Mary Jo's house until the 2011 fire when it burned up. And it hadn't been replaced, but Tony Batiste uh, undertook to give us a new photo blind that is now available for rent. And we also, inspired by our friend Carolyn Ohl at the Christmas Mountains Oasis in West Texas, decided we would put up a couple of shade structures in the little yard area where the, uh, where the old photo blind was and have completely renovated that. And again, thanks so much to a huge amount of work and skill uh, provided by our volunteers. It, it's, we just could not do this, this without our volunteers. We've taken a few other opportunities. Uh, the, the, the lower left there, that little picture is what we call our Sienica garden, where we have a piece of pool liner underneath some soil and sand 
and are growing plants that like to have their roots in water. And it's right there by one of the boulder fountains, which are such popular places for photography where a lot of our, our uh, uh, fabulous birds like to come and drink and bathe and show off. We're also upgrading the seating. The bench there on the lower right is the first of our commemorative benches. Uh, this one was donated by Tom's family in, in uh, memory of his mother and father who were great lovers of nature and his mother was uh, in particular a lover of gardens as well. So it's very appropriate. We're also taking on some pretty big projects as well with the help of the Tucson Audubon Society and a number of funders. Uh, we have, uh, have created an entirely new pond and we're already seeing the wildlife coming in and using it. It's a wonderful thing to see flocks of band-tailed pigeons come down to drink at our new pond, to see uh, swifts, the white-throated swifts, and violet green swallows drinking on the wing over the new pond. Uh, the Tucson Audubon Society has already planted one endangered plant, the Arizona Erango, in this new pond habitat. And we're in line for, what is it, three more plant, two more plant species, and one more plant species, two, two fish, and a frog, <laughs> and the, the Chiricahua leopard frog, aka the Ramsey Canyon frog. So we're, we're again, trying, to, trying to, to make room for as much diversity of wildlife as possible on this beautiful little place. But it is a little place. And one of our, one of our next challenges is, will we be able to expand? Uh, there are properties on either side of us that would be ideal to add to the sanctuary. Currently, we do not have the funding to do so, but we're going to be, depending on the the appreciation and, and support from the birding community to help build a land acquisition fund so that we can expand the sanctuary because you can't do a whole lot of conservation on 6.13 acres. We need a little bit more space than that. And we do want to protect those parts of Ash Canyon uh, from further development, from ending up with you know another eight or 10 houses on, on some of these properties that have, have until now at least, knock on wood, uh, been undeveloped. Of course, the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory, we're continuing on with all of the other things that we were doing before we acquired Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, including banding hummingbirds. This is our 27th season, banding hummingbirds at the San Pedro House. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about next is uh, that um, the results of our research are not very promising. Hummingbirds, like pretty much all other birds, as we've seen some of the you know, big announcements from big conservation organizations like Audubon and American Bird Conservancy, birds are not doing well right now. And hummingbirds in particular are not doing well. Hummingbird populations are way, way down, and we are seeing shifts in those populations. Again, I'll get into a little bit more of that. But that's one of the reasons why we keep up our banding study is because it's documenting these changes that otherwise are they're kind of hearsay. It's hard to know whether there's observer error and, and that sort of thing. When we've got that bird in hand, we can definitively identify it. We can uh, check the females for breeding condition. We can look for fat and parasites and other things that tell us about how well the environment these birds live in is supporting them. And so we're continuing with, again, with a team of fantastic volunteers, we are continuing our hummingbird banding on the San Pedro River. We're now that now that we're kind of starting to move out the other side of the pandemic, we're starting to think about um, starting up our our uh, uh, educational and ecotourism programs again, and uh, that includes uh, some programs here in southeastern Arizona, but also some in other more exotic locales. We're hoping to get uh, trips back to Mexico maybe as early as next spring. And uh, we've got, um, we've already got full trips to Ecuador and Colombia for, for next uh, January and, and June. And we've also got a fabulous opportunity for any of you who might be thinking about traveling. We've got a trip to Trinidad and Tobago in cooperation with Naturalist Journeys. Our friend Peg Abbott asked us to lead another trip to Trinidad and Tobago, and we're very excited. That's, that's become one of our favorite destinations. It's just a wonderful country. And, and the folks that we've met there are just, just outstanding. We just thoroughly enjoy it. So if you're interested in uh, maybe a trip to Trinidad and Tobago, whether you've been before or maybe this would be your first time, take a look on our website. It's December 1st through 11th this year, end of this year. So think about that. It's been really tough watching our, our friends and colleagues around the world suffer during the crash in tourism uh, during the pandemic. Um, many, many folks 
that were working in tourism and conservation just, you know, had to go get other jobs uh, because there was just, there was no way to fund the work that they were doing. And so we're really committed to keeping ecotourism going and continuing to support our friends and colleagues in other parts of the world, especially in those places where our birds spend the winter, uh, to try to, to keep things going. And, and again, moving out on the other side of the pandemic, hopefully that will be uh, uh, possible to bring some of these programs back into full life again once, uh, once folks are more willing to travel. So that's an update from the Bird Observatory and Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. But now I want to turn to a little bit more, a little bit uh, tougher topic to talk about. Hummingbirds, usually I try to keep my presentations about hummingbirds pretty lighthearted. But with the, the results of our research, uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer that hummingbirds are in trouble. And I want to talk tonight to you about where hummingbirds have come from where they are right now, and where we might be, see them in the future. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating story going all the way back 42 million years ago in what's now Europe. That is apparently where hummingbirds originally evolved. The only hummingbird fossils that we have are some fragile, fragile little bones found in those fine-grained limestones that uh, Europe is famous for. Um, one from France and two from Germany, I believe, is, is where those have come from. Uh, when they found these little fossils and uh, started looking at them and wondering what the heck they were, um, and realized that the, the thing they looked most like was a hummingbird, and started, to, and the, the first one was kind of a jumbled little mass of bones, so they were looking at tiny little bones and saying, gosh, that looks like a hummingbird, humorous or whatever. Uh, and so they, they dubbed it uh, Eurotrochilus inexpectatus, the unexpected European hummingbird, which is, I think that's just a cool name. Uh, and then that was the original fossil, and then a couple of other of these Eurotrochilus have been, have been discovered. Now, 42 million years ago is when they had a, their last common ancestor with the Swifts, their closest relatives. Keeping in mind that our human line didn't split from our closest primate relatives until about 20 million years ago. Uh, and the fact that we've only really been fully human for only, only a few hundred thousand years. One of the things about these Eurotrochilus fossils is that I think if, the, if we could magically bring one of these little creatures back to life, it would look almost identical to some of our, our modern hummingbirds. That's, that is how fully formed these little creatures were 30 million years ago. They really found their niche and have been occupying that niche ever since. But the thing is, we don't really know why they disappeared from Europe and Asia. Um, that's going to be one of those mysteries that may never be solved, or maybe a future generation of scientists will figure it out. But right now, we just don't know. But somehow, Hummingbirds managed to get to the other hemisphere, and they settled in uh, on the northwestern part of South America, there where the Andes Mountains were just beginning to rise. Keep in mind that, that the Andes Mountains are actually younger than hummingbirds. The Andes Mountains are created as the Pacific plate dives under the South American plate, and it just crumples up the edge of the plate. And so those mountains have been rising for less time than hummingbirds have been on Earth in recognizable form. But they managed, about 22 million years ago, they managed to find their way to South America, and then they just exploded. They started radiating out into all these niches, following the mountains as they rose and rose, and new habitats developed as they got higher and higher. Uh, and they also started to spread out north and south, and about five million years ago, hummingbirds arrived in North America. It took them a little while to get here because there was a time when there was a big gap between North and Central America and South America. And that gap was hard for them. That ocean crossing was a little hard for them at the time. But they eventually found their way to North America. And most of our familiar hummingbirds split off from their most recent common ancestor with the, the, the older groups of hummingbirds around five million years ago and are continuing to diversify. It's amazing what we're seeing. Now that we're starting to look into their DNA, looking into the, that amazing molecule that's at the center of all of our cells, looking at the DNA of these hummingbirds is telling us some amazing things about their past. 
And we can link that to, to what we know was happening on the surface of the Earth, what the continents looked like, what the oceans looked like, and piece together this picture of how hummingbirds have, be, have come to just completely take over the Americas. Uh, it's, it's truly an astonishing and, and wonderful story, and we're just, we're so lucky that, that we live in a time when hummingbirds had made it to North America. Uh, because there was a time, as you can tell from that map, there was a time when they were really concentrated in South America. And that still, the northwestern part of South America is still where the highest diversity of hummingbird species is found. Um, we've been to uh, Ecuador a couple of times and have had over 60 species of hummingbirds on a couple of our Ecuador trips. And uh, we're going to Colombia in January, and uh, we have been told that we probably have a chance of seeing more than 80 species. That's a pretty high diversity when you consider that the, we're pretty lucky here in southeastern Arizona if we can show you 15 in a week this time of year. There are such extraordinary creatures. I mean, there are a lot of you know diverse little little birds. Uh, the the tyrant flycatchers are a great example because they are the the only family of birds that actually has more members than the hummingbird group does. There are over 350 species, and I have to hedge a little bit because it's hard to keep track. Those of you who saw the most recent American Ornithological Society uh, checklist committee results know that we now have four new species of hummingbirds. They did lump a hummingbird, so we lost one, but we've got four new ones. The broad-billed hummingbird is now split into broad-billed, and then down in Mexico, turquoise crowned and Tres Marias hummingbird. Uh, the what used to be Antillean mango is now Hispaniolan mango and um, and Puerto Rican mango and uh, help me out Tom streamer tails that's right yeah the black billed and red billed streamer tails were once considered were for a time anyway considered the same species and now they have been split so it's hard to keep track but over 350 species by most accountings uh, they are are remarkably diverse. Uh, and you really, in order to appreciate them, really have to study the, the tropical ones uh, because that's where they have had the longest time to, to diversify and specialize in different types of habitats, relationships with different types of plants. But they, they are just really magical little creatures. And I often think about those very first humans that came to North America. We now know that they came here probably close to 40,000 years ago. We have a brand new archaeological site in New Mexico uh, in which a, a family of ancient mammoth hunters butchered a mammoth uh, and looking at, uh, looking at the carbon dating of the remains, it was about 38,000 years ago. So we're keep, we keep pushing back the human occupation of the Americas uh, with all these new discoveries. But even with that, it must have been quite a shock for both parties when the first mammoth hunters arrived in North America and were greeted by our North American hummingbirds. The Rufus hummingbird was probably the very first hummingbird ever seen by human eyes, and I'm pretty sure it was not happy. It, I, I have this image in my mind of the Rufus hummingbird seeing all these two-legged hairy things and going, ah, there goes the neighborhood. But with this, with this new discovery by us humans coming to this new continent and meeting all these new creatures, hummingbirds have been a particular source of fascination for a lot of indigenous colors, cultures, as well as, as cultures all the way up to the modern day. Uh, the hummingbirds have been celebrated by, by peoples of the deserts, people of the mountains, people of the, of the tropical forests. Certainly the amazing geoglyphs of the Nazca Plain in Peru are extraordinary. Uh, hummingbirds obviously meant a great deal to those people, uh, as they have to the people of, of our American Southwest, where they were considered harbingers of the rainy season, uh, and to the people of, of, of the Mayan cultures in Central America, where, uh, where they, were, they were considered um, um, the, the teachers. They were considered uh, as instructors of human behavior, there's this wonderful vase that came out of one of the temples in Tikal, where there was a burial, that uh, shows the the uh, one of the the principal gods of the of the Mayans, Itzamna, having a conversation with a hummingbird, and the hummingbird is telling him, "You need to drink this stuff in the morning and this stuff in the evening." So they were experts on beverages. 
But hummingbirds, regardless of what our cultural associations with them are, whether we consider them harbingers of rain or you know, magical messengers from, from our deities or whether we see them in a very scientific sense, they are creatures of their environments. No hummingbird exists in a vacuum. And so that's so important for us to understand because with all of the species that we have, there's a good bit of specialization. And as the environment changes, the ability of, of some of these hummingbirds to live in that environment also changes. And mostly it's not for the better. One of the examples, of course, related to climate change is the changing bloom times of a lot of our flowers. Uh, the, the example a lot of people have heard of, because there was quite a lot of publicity about it a couple of years ago, is that uh, they've been studying the blooming cycles of the beautiful yellow glacier lilies up in above Timberline in the Rocky Mountains. And they're finding that the glacier lilies that used to bloom, used to emerge from those last bits of snow, just about the time the first broad-tailed hummingbirds arrive. They're blooming earlier now because it's getting warmer earlier. And if the hummingbirds cannot keep up, if, humming, if the broad-tailed hummingbirds are not increasing the speed of their migration north, pretty soon these two species are going to get so out of sync that the lily will lose its primary pollinator and the hummingbird will lose an extremely important spring nectar source. It's not just the glacier lilies up above Timberline and the Rockies that are affected though. Uh, pollinator and plant relationships uh, of course, are, are, can be very, very complicated. In the case of hummingbirds, we have a number of different plant species. Some are more woody and shrubby, or even species of trees. Some are little annuals. In the case of the ocotillo, ocotillo is another plant, like the glacier lily, that is sensitive to temperature. It blooms very early, like in January, uh, down in the Sonoran Desert of uh, western Sonora, along the coastal plain of Sonora, about the time that the Rufus and Allen's hummingbirds are moving north. Uh, and it's dependent on the temperature. The, as the temperature begins to rise, the day length helps, but the temperatures beginning to rise is really what seems to trigger the bloom of ocotillos because even though they're blooming in January in southern Sonora, they don't bloom until May or even June up here in Arizona. And those birds being able to follow that wave of ocotillo blooms north is very important for those migrants. That's the dry season in the Sonoran Desert. And there's not a lot else that blooms that time of year reliably. So when, again, when the, the timing of the flowering of the Ocotillo gets out of sync with the timing of the arrival of the northbound hummingbirds, that's a problem. On the other end of migration, we've got our little red Transpecos morning glories that mm, I, you're probably just starting to see a few of those little red flowers out. They're just beginning to bloom. This is a species of morning glory that is an, it is an annual. So the little seedlings come up only when the weather is nice and warm and when there's plenty of moisture. And of course, that's during our monsoon. It's plenty warm in June, but there's no moisture. It's plenty moist some years in February and March, but it's too cold. So it takes a combination of warm weather and lots of moisture to get these little morning glory seeds to sprout. But the tragedy is when those morning glory seeds sprout, and our monsoon is irregular, when our monsoon starts up and then it stops, as it has a number of times, and it seems to be getting more frequent that this is happening, those tender little delicate seedlings die. And then we lose not only that generation of morning glories, we lose the generations of seeds that they might have produced, and our hummingbirds don't have anything to eat. So these are the, are the kinds of disconnects that we're starting to see in these plant and pollinator relationships specifically with our hummingbirds. Um, one of the, the things that in our banding study on the San Pedro, when we see hummingbirds in small numbers around the feeders at the San Pedro house, but the ones we see are all carrying pollen, that's a sign things are good because those birds are out there feeding on the natural flowers and not coming for a handout of sugar water. When our birds are swarming around the feeders and there's no pollen on any of them, that's when we're really troubled. And we can always link that to the amount of rainfall that we've received. Another consequence of a warming climate is uh, in increasing frequency and intensity and a disruption of the natural timing of wildfires. Wildfires are actually really important to a lot of species. They're, they're a way in our relatively dry western forests of recycling a lot of that stuff that falls out of the trees. 
the branches, the needles, the bark, trees that fall on the ground in a lot of our western forests just lay there and mummify. And literally the people who are studying the tree rings uh, to try to, to not only do some archeology span with them, match them up to, to wooden beams in ancient houses and things like that, but also looking at the ecology of these things. Uh, they can go and take tree ring data, you know, back over a thousand years from some of these mummified logs on the forest floor. So it, fire is very, very important, but fire has to happen at the right time. It can't, you can't have fire starting in March and April and then having them bloom for, or burn for weeks until we finally start getting rain at the end of June or early July. That's highly destructive. And of course, it's a consequence to humans as well because often our homes and our farms and our wildlife, our, our uh, livestock are in the path of these fires. But fire is very important, but we're starting to get a disruption in the timing of the fires. And they're often much more intense because they're just burning so, so long that they burn much more than they would have if they had started at a more normal time. It's tough because when we do have the right intensity of fire, um, the right duration of fire, it can be magical. There are plants that are specifically adapted to coming up <clears throat> after fires, and many of these are hummingbird pollinated. Plants like the beautiful pink fireweed, uh, and uh, a number of our, our native uh, southeastern Arizona hummingbird pollinated plants, they are at their most lush and their most flower filled after a fire has come through and provided them with a burst of, of nutrients in the form of ash. There are some species that you can't even germinate the seeds very well unless you provide them with smoke. They have to be exposed to water that has been filtered through ash or or has been contaminated by smoke. There's something about the chemistry of that fire water, as it were, not, not in the like alcoholic beverage sense, but there's something about the chemistry of that fire water that stimulates some of these fire dependent uh, seeds to germinate uh, much better uh, than if they were just exposed to ordinary rainwater. So we really need fire, but it is a, it is a two, double edged sword. One of the, the most spectacular sites I've ever seen hummingbird-wise north of, say, Ecuador or Colombia was in a, a, a burned over pine forest over in the Sierra Madre Occidental along the western side of Chihuahua, the western border, near the western border of Chihuahua. This fire, it, it must have only happened maybe just two, three, four weeks before and there was an explosion of wildfire, wildflowers, and the hummingbirds were swarming. It was migration season, and the rufous hummingbirds, the calliopes, the broadtails were duking it out over this massive display of wildflowers. And it's the kind of thing that, that really maybe gives you a little different view of what a fire is really about and, and how it, it has an impact on the wildlife. Uh, but we need, we need fire, but we need fire to happen at the right time and the, for the right duration, or else it ends up being very destructive and, and, and altering the habitat so much that it can no longer recover to the state that it once was. Another impact is more directly attributable to us and uh, isn't so direct, much uh, uh, an impact of climate change, but of course it's exacerbated by climate change and that is grazing. When we put too many livestock out on our public lands especially, uh, there are some hummingbird pollinated plants that are just considered super, super tasty by cows, by sheep, and they are selectively grazed uh, and eliminated from the landscape. And when you, when you destroy these nectar plants, there's nothing for the hummingbirds to eat when they come through in, in their migrations. Uh, even overpopulations of big things with horns antlers that uh, hunters like to shoot as trophies, that's a bit, uh, a bit too tough too, because uh, when we don't allow the natural predation cycles to happen, when we allow uh, very, very large populations of deer and elk in particular to take over the landscape, that's also hard on the plants that a lot of our pollinators need, specifically hummingbirds. We also have issues with, uh, with other things, that, that ways that we meddle with the environment, and some of it's accidental and some of it's deliberate. Uh, in the case of the Chinese mantis, which this little black-chinned hummingbird is very upset about, 
uh, that's, that was a deliberate introduction. Even though North America has a wonderful variety of native mantis species, including some that are big enough to eat hummingbirds, by the way, uh, somehow gardeners back in the day, you know, probably over 100 years ago, decided that our native mantises were not good enough, and so they imported mantises from Asia. The Chinese mantid, the, I don't know if you still can, I hope not, but you used to be able to buy their egg cases. In the backs of gardening magazines, there'd be ad for mantis egg cases, the gardener's friend. When you've got lots of friends, you've got, you know, all of our native mantises are your friends. It's like, what are we, chopped liver? Uh, but, you know, they're putting these Chinese mantis egg cases out in their, in their gardens, and these great big huge mantises, bigger than any of our native mantises, are eating a lot of our native pollinators, including the occasional hummingbird. About half the records that um, a recent paper on, on mantis predation on birds, about half the cases where they've where uh, they found uh, mantis predation in North America were attributable to, to the Chinese mantis on, on birds, specifically mainly hummingbirds, but occasionally other birds as well, were attributable to the Chinese mantis. Um, they are, they're um, not very friendly creatures. Um, and, uh, but we also have uh, plants that are non-native and are taking over swaths of landscape and driving a lot of our, crowding out a lot of our native plants that are very important to our pollinators, including our hummingbirds. And of course, we have diseases like West Nile virus and the, uh, the latest iteration of the avian flu that we know hummingbirds are vulnerable to. So there's all these, all these issues. Again, some deliberate, like the Chinese mantis, some of them kind of out of our control, but we still have a hand in, in them, like the proliferation of, of various diseases. Some of the winners and losers here, the rufous has been a big loser. We're seeing huge declines in the numbers of rufous hummingbirds. And some of this decline is apparently attributable to pesticides. A recent study on rufous hummingbirds found, I think it was five different types of pesticides in rufous hummingbirds in British Columbia, and that all of them were, were known to be used in the blueberry farms. So it kind of makes you want to go with the organic blueberries. Uh, and uh, of course, these birds, they're, the rufous hummingbirds go up to uh, northwestern North America, to western Canada and south southeastern Alaska. And they're mostly nesting in really remote areas, areas where there's not a lot of humans at all, much less a lot of agriculture. But they migrate, and they migrate through these landscapes where there is a lot of agriculture. And there's a lot of spraying, there's a lot of, of the uh, systemic pesticides, the neonics or neonicotinoids that are applied as root drenches or are, are uh, used to encapsulate the seeds to prevent the seeds from being eaten by insects. And these things are having an impact on, on a lot of our wildlife, including our birds, including our hummingbirds. Black-chin hummingbird is kind of a mixed bag. We're seeing black-chin hummingbirds increasing along the front range of the Rockies as more and more cities and towns are being built out in grassland, what was once grassland habitat, places that used to be the domain of lark buntings and horned larks are now uh, being built up and all these you know, gardens and trees and shrubs and flowers are bringing in black chin hummingbirds. And they're very adaptable little guys, but we're also here in southeastern Arizona, we're seeing drastic drops in their populations here where they were once very common. They used to be the commonest hummingbird along the San Pedro River. They used to be the commonest hummingbird up in the foothills of the Huachuca Mountains and the other mountain ranges. And their numbers are really declining drastically. They're giving way in many places to Anna's hummingbird. Anna's hummingbird is now the commonest hummingbird at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. Used to be black chinned. Now it's Anna's hummingbird. Anna's hummingbirds are big and they're tough. They're very adaptable. They love urban and suburban areas, but they're finding their way into places where the changing climate is providing them with opportunities. And being as big and tough competitors as they are, they're apparently elbowing out of the birds that used to live there. So we're seeing fewer and fewer black chin hummingbirds, and more and more Anna's hummingbirds. Costa's hummingbird is already a desert hummingbird, so you'd think, well, gosh, you know, the global warming, that, that's, that's tailor-made for Costa's hummingbirds. But there are some parts of the deserts that are already so brutal that there's only a matter of a few weeks of the year when, that when Costa's hummingbird can really prosper there. Some of those areas are so marginal for coastal hummingbirds, they're gonna be disappearing from those areas. We are seeing them increase in numbers in some of the higher elevation areas. Some of the edges of our high deserts here are beginning to see more 
Costas hummingbirds as breeding birds arriving in March and doing a quick little breeding season in uh, March, April, May, and then heading off to wherever Costas hummingbirds disappear to this time of year. But overall, they're going to lose a lot of their habitat in the deserts as those deserts get just too hot and dry to support the, the life that they need to live. One of the saddest for me, because this is a bird that uh, Tom and I, when we managed Ramsey Canyon Preserve back in from 1988 through 1995, it was a, a real signature bird for Ramsey Canyon Preserve. Uh, Ram, the Ramsey Canyon had probably the second highest population in the United States next to the, the very large population over in Cave Creek Canyon. But they have virtually disappeared from Ramsey Canyon. It used to be you couldn't go to Ramsey Canyon and take a walk up the, up the Hamburg Trail without hearing the beep, 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 beep radar ping of male blue-throated hummingbirds singing from the lower branches of the sycamore trees. And now you don't hear that. If, you're, if you do hear it, you're lucky. There's a scattering of them here and there, but that, that population that used to be so robust and, and healthy has all but disappeared. Uh, and it's really tragic. There's still blue-throated hummingbirds in Mexico, of course, but even their habitats in Mexico are getting drier and hotter and less able to support a bird like this that loves those lush, shady canyons with perennial streams. There's just not as many of those perennial streams left anymore. So what can we do to help? I don't want to be all gloom and doom and not give you some stuff you can take home. Uh, because all of us can do little things, and some of us might feel inclined to do some bigger things. So I'm going to start with the little things that pretty much anybody can do. Starting with, you can plant nectar-producing flowers. Even if you live in a fifth-floor condo, if you've got a little balcony, you can put a pot of flowers out there and provide a little nectar for passing hummingbirds. Uh, those of us who have a little more space, like at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, uh, we can really go to town with the hummingbird-pollinated plants and provide them with a lot of, of nectar. And we can help to, to even out some of the, the excessive variability in the climate uh, the, uh, by uh, irrigating and mulching and all the things that we can do as gardeners. So that's number one, is get those nectar producing plants out there. Uh, two is avoid pesticides. You don't wanna be planting all these beautiful plants uh, only to add poison to them that may contaminate the birds or contaminate their food sources. This isn't the be most beautiful hummingbird picture you're ever gonna see, but this is one of the most important. This is a little black-chinned hummingbird with her crop packed full of little insects, mostly little leaf hoppers, the kind of little sucking insects that those neonicotinoid pesticides are, are unfortunately quite deadly to. Uh, fortunately, she lives along the San Pedro River where we don't, we don't have the use of neonics right in that immediate area. However, uh, she has to pass through landscapes in migration where pesticides are being used. And so uh, contamination is virtually uh, inevitable for her. But when we kill off the insects that they feed on, this is especially important during the breeding season. Their babies have to have the, the vitamins, minerals, proteins, amino acids, all the little micronutrients that are present in insects that are not present in flower nectar. And in order to do that, these little moms work so very hard catching little flies and gnats and spiders and leafhoppers and all kinds of things in order to make sure that these that their babies have all the nutrients they need to grow on. When we reduce the availability of those insects by applying pesticides, those babies lose out, those babies starve to death. Those moms do not reproduce successfully. And so avoid pesticides in your yard and Here's the intersection between planting nectar plants and avoiding pesticides. One of the things that has, has been really frustrating for a lot of us in the hummingbird gardening community is that a lot of the mainstream nursery centers and, and all, they, they sell plants that have been treated with some, plant, some pesticides that are very, very bad for hummingbirds and other pollinators. And they don't necessarily label them, so you don't really know. What I've learned to do, though, is to look for the grower on the tag. It may be in that little tag that has the picture of the plant that they stick into the pot. It may be on a little label on the side like this one was. But if you can find the name of that grower and whip out your smartphone and Google, you know, some of these growers will say right out on their website, we use, we use pesticides. And they'll be very defensive about it. We use pesticides and, and, and they don't hurt bees. Well, yes, they do. Um, and others 
are uh, very much uh, adamant the other way. I was very pleased that Proven Winners, which is a, a big uh, grower that uh, they produce a lot of kind of boutique plants. Every year they come out with a new line of plants. It's almost like the Paris fashion shows or something where Proven Winners comes out with their latest and greatest varieties of, of very popular bedding plants and all. But I was very pleased to see a very strong statement on the Proven Winners website saying that we don't use neonicotinoids. The pesticides that we use are very short duration. They break down very quickly. And we don't sell, we don't send the plant off to, to the retail nurseries until the pesticides have cleared the plant systems. Uh, they also don't sell plants that are invasive, which is another important thing. But uh, it, what my policy now at garden centers is I check for that grower, check to see who that is, look them up on their website. If they don't say anything at all about pesticides on their website, I figure they're avoiding the subject. So I don't buy that plant. No matter how beautiful it is, no matter how gorgeous it would look in my garden, I don't buy that plant. If they have a website that says, yeah, we use, we use pesticides, so what? I don't buy that plant. If it's a statement like from Proven Winners, I'll buy that plant. The best thing to do, of course, is to patronize native plant nurseries and organic growers, little you know, mom and pop operations, because that helps your local economy better than buying from the big box stores anyway. But of course, there's some things that are more easily available from the big box stores than from your mom and pop nursery down the street. If you do use feeders, and I don't strong arm anybody into using feeders. People sometimes think I'm some sort of the massive advocate for using feeders. If you want to use feeders, use feeders. If you don't, don't. But if you do use feeders, please keep them clean. Because unfortunately, contaminated feeders can be a source of disease for birds. They may pick up uh, an infection from drinking fouled sugar water, sugar water that's been left us out for a few days too long. They may pick up viruses and bacteria off of the perch surfaces uh, and end up with something like avian pox. Uh, it's probably not a coincidence that the hummingbird species that we see with avian pox most often is Anna's hummingbird because they're such an urban and suburban bird. And so they come in contact with, you know, the house finches that use your hum hummingbird feeder and that sort of thing. Keep those feeders clean. I use hydrogen peroxide. It's good against bacteria, molds, fungi, viruses. Just spray it inside and out on your feeder. Uh, leave it to sit for a few minutes while you make up some nice fresh sugar water. And then give that feeder a scrub and a good rinse with hot water and refill it and put it back out. And do that you know, every one to three days during the warmer weather. More often when the weather's very, very hot or when we've had a lot of rain like we had yesterday, um, you can, can slack off a little bit and do every three or maybe even every four days when the weather's quite cool, if you're feeding hummingbirds through the winter, for example. But keep those feeders clean. That's very important. And of course, very important for all birds, or at least anything that flies, is preventing window collisions. And most of us have an opportunity of one kind or another to prevent window collisions. But I got to tell you, those cute little, little stickers that they sell you in like a pack of four or six, if you have a big window, that's not going to work. If you're trying to keep birds from hitting your little two foot by two foot bathroom window, those are fine. But you have to put these, these stickers on the window at two to four inch intervals, depending on what kinds of birds you're trying to keep from impacting the windows. So that's why we recommend other solutions other than those cute little stickers that you can buy at the bird store. Uh, and at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, if you, have a, if you have an opportunity to visit, please be sure and look at the big three-part window on the side of the house because we have three different types of uh, bird collision avoidance uh, 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 measures. Uh, one is uh, strings, basically paracord hung in front of the windows. That is a version of what they call the Zen wind curtain, uh, popularized by the Ecopian family who are the, the Ecopian folks have been uh, promoting this type of uh, bird collision avoidance for many, many years and have contributed to research on bird window collisions. They've probably saved millions of birds' lives. Uh, we made our own DIY version, but it works just fine. Uh, the middle panel there is a film called Kaleidoscape. And it's the same film that they put on the outside of city buses where you see your, your Channel 5 news team. Uh, staring out at you from the side of the bus. That printable film is also available from the Kaleidoscape Company. You can have it printed in a solid color or you can put a photo on it if you want to put the Channel 5 News team on your windows. I guess you can. Um, 
And uh, it is really, really effective. It does diminish your view from inside a little bit, but on the plus side, it gives you some privacy, at least during the daytime, uh, because that, that it's not quite opaque, but it's opaque enough with the light reflected off of it that people cannot see in. And then on the right side is a product called Feather Friendly Dots that are made by a company in Canada, and we got them from, I think it was the Seattle Audubon Society. Uh, are retailing them here in the United States. Uh, so there are all kinds of, of ways that you can can avoid window collisions. And that would, if we could all, you know, if we have problems with window collisions, if we could all take those windows and modify them so that we can prevent those collisions, if enough of us did that, it would literally save millions of birds' lives every year. Another thing with increasing drought and heat is water sources become that much more important providing them birds with healthy, clean water. And with hummingbirds, it's more for bathing than it is for drinking because hummingbirds have such a high liquid diet anyway. They don't usually need to drink except when conditions are really, really hot and dry. Uh, but keeping their feathers in good condition is very, very important. And so providing them with a thin film of flowing water, that's their favorite way to bathe. And making sure that water is clean, isn't, hasn't been you know, pooped in by the last hundred house finches that visited it. Uh, those things are very, very important. They're going to become increasingly important as the climate continues to warm. And another thing that we can do that's just kind of a good idea in pretty much any urban suburban area is provide the birds with safe nest material. Some of the plants that they rely on are not blooming as well, and so they're not producing the fluffy seed plumes that are our favorite uh, nest material for hummingbirds. Uh, and especially in urban and suburban areas where a lot of these plants don't even naturally occur anymore, because there's just not room for them amongst all the concrete and asphalt. Um, they're using non-natural materials, things like uh, acrylic yarn and, and uh, cigarette filters and, and pink fiberglass insulation. That can't be good for the delicate skin of those baby hummingbirds. So providing them with nice natural type material that's safe for them. And it can even be uh, the, the uh, soft, fluffy combings out of your dog or cat. If you have a light-colored dog or cat, give them a nice bath. Don't put any flea shampoo or anything on them. And then give them a good combing and get that soft, fluffy undercoat out. Stuff it into an onion bag or a clean suet cage. And, and that is great material for hummingbird nests. They like white material. The animal hair has natural oils in it that, that make it more waterproof than Things like, you know, we don't recommend that you use dryer lint for one thing. That's, people get, ask me that all the time. I don't recommend dryer lint in part because it's microplastics with all the synthetic fibers that we use, but in part because it just, it's not very water resistant. Uh, just in that way, you can kind of keep tabs on the local females, see when they come and, and visit uh, to take the nesting material. In our yard down in Bisbee, we had a female violet crown two years ago that we watched her take material from our nesting material dispenser four different times across the season, far enough apart that we know that she tried nesting at least four times that year. So they can give you some insight into the, into the bird's family life that way. Now, I don't fault anyone for not wanting to be mm, confrontational, not wanting to, you know, shout to the rafters that, uh, that hummingbirds need protecting. Uh, but for those who are willing to take it another step, there are things that you can do. You can be a voice for hummingbirds. And I hope at least some of you will consider this. If you are not already the kind of person who uh, speaks out on behalf of wildlife, I hope that you'll take that next step and be a voice for hummingbirds and other creatures. For one thing, you can encourage pollinator-friendly landscaping uh, around the, the, your city or town, whether it's parks and schools uh, or government buildings or even businesses. This uh, particular pollinator habitat sign was at the La Posada Hotel, a historic hotel in Winslow, Arizona. We were absolutely thrilled. We had a, uh, one of our volunteers suggested that we drop by there and take a look at it while we were in Northern Arizona. And we were not expecting to walk through a, a beautiful pollinator habitat on the way into this historic hotel. You never know where you can find these things. Even little tiny pocket habitats are often enough to really make a difference for those creatures that use it, whether they're birds or bees or butterflies or whatever. You can also ask, and when I say ask, I really kind of mean harangue, bully, uh, the mainstream retail nurseries, including your garden center at your Lowe's and your Home Depot and your Ace Hardware, into carrying pollinator safe 
nursery stock. There are companies like Proven Winners and a few others that are offering uh, plants for your garden, especially things like the annuals that you like to, the pansies and snapdragons and things like that that you have out temporarily uh, for certain times of the year that are have been grown without pesticides that are harmful to pe pollinators and that can be safe in your garden. But often, again, often the ones that don't have any label are not safe. Uh, and they don't label them for, for a reason. Uh, so be, being sure to you know, cultivate a relationship with that garden center manager and say, you know, can you, can you get some of these plants that are not grown with pesticides and harmful to pollinators? Because I'd really like to protect my pollinators, but I'd also like to buy your plants. And of course, supporting policies that recognize the importance of birds and bees and other wildlife and uh, incorporate protections for them in management of public lands in particular, whether they're urban parks and green belts or whether they're national wildlife refuges and national parks. Um, just making sure that we leave room for wildlife uh, and, and incorporate that into our public policies is so very important. Now, any of you who are already uh, uh, calling, writing, emailing your, your representatives, let them know that you support wildlife-friendly policies and that you support evidence-based, science-based management of our public lands and resources and that you want action on climate change because climate change is an existential threat not only to us, not only to them, but also to us. Their future is our future. We are all in this together on this little blue marble that we, that we live on. So what we do for them, we're also doing for future generations of our own species as well. So I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I don't want to keep you too late because you've got wonderful field trips in the morning, I'm sure, and lots of other great activities to enjoy at the festival. I did want to put this up in case you want to snap a picture with your cell phone, uh, but we're pretty easy to find on the web. Sabo's website is sabo.org. We have information about our programs. We have ways you can donate and and contribute to, for example, Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. Uh, my website has lots of information about hummingbirds, about feeding hummingbirds, about identifying hummingbirds, uh, and it is fieldguidetohummingbirds.com. So, so I thank you all very, very much for your attention this evening. You've been a lovely audience. And again, I hope you enjoy the rest of this beautiful weekend here in southeastern Arizona. Anybody have questions or are we all just dazed? Yeah. We just did that last weekend. Yeah, we did it last weekend. Game and Fish was kind of low key about it this year. I think they were kind of just feeling their way back into it. They'd had uh, quite a bit of personnel changes go on during the pandemic. And so the folks that were, that were instrumental in setting it up and everything the last time we did it for the public were no longer with the agency or had moved on to other jobs. And so it was a whole new crew and I think they kind of wanted to keep it small, but we did it and we had people attend and people had fun and hopefully next year it'll be more like, more like we remember it from past years. Thanks for asking. Are there burning questions? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, thank you for asking that because that is a big part of a new construction and in particular new construction of commercial and government buildings. There's actually a Bird Safe Building Act uh, in one of the committees in Congress uh, that would require all new federal buildings to incorporate uh, collision, bird collision strike preventatives, including what's called fritted glass. You ever heard of fritted glass? It's basically, you know, big chunks of glass, but it has this pattern etched into it that the birds can detect. And they, they, then they see that glass as a barrier where they didn't really see the glass at all before and would just be, you know, slam into it full blast. I suspect it is, but you would probably have to, if you were, if you were having a site, a, a, a home custom built, you'd have to inquire with your builder. And again, you might have to do a little arm twisting because it's a fairly exotic product still for, for home-based 
uh, applications, but it's being used increasingly on, on public buildings. That there are a lot of public buildings that are out there killing birds, and the only way to do anything about those buildings is to, to etch the glass or add patterns to it or whatever from, you know, appliques on the outside or whatever. But if you're starting from scratch, it's always great to try to incorporate uh, anything that will help prevent you from having to do that at some time in the future. So I would definitely recommend looking into fritted glass. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy has a section of their website devoted to bird collisions. And one of the very useful things that, that I've found in doing our research to, uh, to uh, do bird strike mitigation at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary is their database of different bird strike mitigation products and how well they work. So you'll want to pay attention to the effectiveness rating. It's a little, the number is a little counterintuitive. I think the, the higher the, the, the higher the number, the, the less effective it is. So, but it's, it's very, very useful. And it does have some products that aren't even available in the United States. But, you know, they're trying to be an international resource. So that's definitely a first stop uh, and to see what, uh, what companies produce these because they do have information about where you could acquire some of these things. American Bird Conservancy used to sell its own product called Bird Tape, which was a pretty easy application to the outside of the window to break up the reflection. They no longer provide that, but they do have this tremendous resource database uh, to uh, fill you in on what types of, of uh, bird collision uh, abatement products are available and how effective they are. American Bird Conservancy. And they have, they have sections on their website about pesticides, about cats and wildlife, and about bird collisions, uh, and wind power and some other things. So they, they're a big issues focused conservation organization. And that I have definitely found the section on uh, window collisions to be extremely helpful to me in figuring out what we wanted to do with Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary to prevent collisions. We're still working on it, but we do have that, that three-part demo window just so that people can see what some of the options are available to them. You don't always have to stick something on the glass. It can be in front of the glass and still be very effective. In fact, maybe more effective than stuff on the glass. Any other questions? Yes, Chris. Uh, that's been one of my little uh, side projects the last couple of years. I've been trying to find some solution to that. And it's tough. Um, I, I'm, I, I've been hoping I was on track, but you know, even the honeybees, even the feral honeybees have been so affected by the persistent drought that I haven't even been able to find anyone with enough bees on their feeders to, to help me test some of the things I've been looking at. But one of the plus sides of that is that um, there are other applications for honeybee specific repellents. Uh, specifically in cattle feeding operations where they're feeding them sugar cane. Because that sweet sugar in the sap of the sugar cane, the re residue that's in the fibrous stuff that's left over once they squeeze all the good stuff out, the bees will often come and swarm the, the feeding operations, the livestock feeding operations, and keep the cattle from, from feeding and even sting the cattle. And of course, livestock growers don't like that at all. Unfortunately, one of the things they found to be most effective is a tobacco extract. They basically just soaked a bunch of cigarette butts in some water and sprayed it on. <laughs> it worked, but I don't think any of us really want to spray cigarette butt water on our hummingbird feeders. The best thing you can really do right now, until we find something that, that can help with, with feeders that maybe are not quite so well designed, is to choose a feeder that already has some bee resistance built into it. Uh, at the sanctuary, we were using the best one hummingbird feeders that have the flat top and the little uh, cylindrical base and the big vinegar type bottle. Um, and we found those to be, unfortunately, really vulnerable to bees. So I started looking around to see what the latest and greatest bottle style feeders are because there's only so much of the year that you know, if you've got a lot of migrant hummingbirds around, you can't use those little four and six and 12 ounce saucers that are relatively resistant to hummingbird to bees. 
because there's too many hummingbirds and they'll drain them three or four times a day. So we needed a bottle feeder and I found, uh, and I unfortunately I can't endorse all the products from Droll Yankees anymore because the company has changed management and they're kind of doing some stuff that I'm not real crazy about, but their one feeder that we really, really like that's very thoughtfully designed and, and quite bee resistant is called the Classic Hummingbird Feeder. It has this pretty little kind of twisted glass bottle, a little red cap that screws onto the bottle and has a little D-shaped uh, wire ring to hang from. But the important part is down in the base. The base has relatively small holes. The feeder does come with little inserts that you can put over these little flanges inside. The birds don't like those though, and they get moldy and they're just a nuisance. You'd be better not to use them. But fortunately, the holes are small enough that it does keep out honeybees. Doesn't keep out some of our little native bees. That's a continuing problem, but it does keep out honeybees. But the genius part of it is that the base, the bottom, the reservoir where the water, where the sugar water comes in and pools to be accessible to the birds, has a double wall. So if the feeder is swinging in the wind, or it's swinging because a Gila woodpecker landed on it, or an acorn woodpecker landed on it, the sugar water comes out into the space between the two walls and it can't get to the outside of the feeder where the bees can get to it. So we really like that Droll Yankees classic hummingbird feeder. And it comes in a 16 ounce size, which is good enough. You know, it's, it's not quite a 32 ounce bottle like the, uh, like the best one, but it's a much easier feeder to maintain and much less likely to be attacked by bees. It's a great question, thanks. Are we going to send you all to bed now so you can have dream, have uh, visions of sugar plums or something? <laughs> visions of varied bunnings? They're kind of sugar plum colored. Uh, dancing in your heads? Again, thank you all so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You're going to have a fabulous time. So. Five more minutes. The winners are.